everybody welcome back to the podcast again we are in the basement this week because we have a very special guest that was in bali so we had to do it over zoom bali bali Bali, whatever so we had to do it over zoom and his name is dennis aka the anxiety guy not going to get too much into it but it was a great episode we've actually had um, a few people so last episode we spoke a little bit about and our anxiety and anxiety in general and we had a few people reach out about um talking more about anxiety we were talking more about i think social anxiety and like moving into like a different phase in your life and how that causes anxiety we'll definitely do a whole episode on that because i know a lot of people liked it um, i mean not a lot there's only like a couple people there's like, like, there's like, there's like three but still you know like i think that's really important because i didn't think of it when somebody messaged us from a different kind of perspective saying this anxiety can be triggered because you're moving into like a different phase in your life and it's almost like she was a good word like a culture shock almost where it's like yeah. shit like something new is happening that i'm not used to so anyways not i won't get too much into it because we'll make a whole episode on that but well, i just know if you guys are open to that just like the shift from moving from i guess i don't want to say a teenager but like a young adult to like an actual adult you know with like idle things and like responsibilities and you kind of get like nervous doing certain things because it's like it's gonna really affect like your decisions and like the future anyways um Mm. i kind of want to preface our guests a little bit okay so our guest is dennis aka the anxiety guy dennis simsek um the anxiety guy when we were on the call with him i did let him know that we that i had Sorry. Yes. I did let him know that I had connected with his YouTube channel um, back in like 2020, but I didn't want to like <laughs> like be too full on in the fact that like I was obsessed with his YouTube channel. <laughs> but it's so crazy because Dennis obviously didn't know us until right now, but I've known him since like 2020 when the pandemic started, I was going through, I just want to preface this because this is what the episode's about. And we, you know, we interviewed him more than we talked about ourselves, but you can talk about you too if you want. I just want to say that I've always had health anxiety. I've always, like, if I, if I had a, if I had a headache, I thought I had a brain tumor. And it's not even funny. Like, it's, people will laugh and be like, hey, you're so fucked. Like, no. But I, I'm dead serious. Like, I would make my mom, when I was 12 years old, take me to a doctor and get MRIs and things like that because it was sickening. I would have panic, it's physical panic attacks over health anxiety. Um, do, do you ever remember when I was, like, on the couch and I was blue and white and my mom and dad, they didn't know what to do. They're yeah, like, yeah. They, they had no clue what to do. Um... The health anxiety was bad, and I remember having it ever since, like, the age of 12. Um, It was on and off for, like, years. Like, I would go, like, months from symptom to symptom. So I had a pain in my chest for three weeks straight, and I thought it was something. I would go to chiropractors, do Mm x-rays. It was nothing. Then once that subsided, it's almost like something new came up. Then I had a lump on my arm, and I would... I would touch it and touch it and touch it. I'm like, it's growing. And or it's you like, had like really bad with germs. Remember you used to wash your hands? Oh my God. All the I time. washed like a, my hands obsessively to the point. She went through a phase where she was like a germaphobe almost. But it was like really fucking bad. Her hands were scaly. My mom had to like put Vaseline in socks and she slept with like fucking socks in her hands because she was like, it's kind of weird because like COVID now and now you're just like, mm. Yeah, I mean, this was before COVID. But, but anyways, yeah. what I'm trying to say is that once COVID hit, another kind of sprint of health anxiety came up, likely because I, you know, was just graduated. It was also like a transition in my life. I graduated. I was trying to, you know, figure out what I wanted to do. We were in a lockdown. But when I say my health anxiety got bad, like it was consuming me to the point where I would wake up thinking, like touching whatever point in my body I had a symptom with, like wake up like that. Like I... This was when I wasn't journaling, wasn't meditating, nothing. I would just wake up and I'm like, I might die today. And I, it it was to the point where like, I would tell my sister, no offense. She wouldn't really like care to listen to me because it was almost like, you're fine. Like I get it. But at the same time, it was like, I was craving someone to just be like, this is normal. And the only reason why I said that is because I think I had health anxiety before. Like I went through a phase before (laughs) Sam went through her like health anxiety where I was really bad and I knew how she was feeling, but I knew that it was just kind of in her head. So I didn't mean to dismiss it like you're fine, stop. But I was kind of saying like it's f- like you're fine because like it's no- actually nothing to like. No, I know. But really what I'm, worry about what I'm saying is I was looking for almost that like not validation, but just like that someone understood. And my like I knew like realistically that 
there was nothing wrong with me and I did go to the doctor every once in a while and and you know like if there was something wrong I'd be dead by now type of thing if if the things I thought were wrong with me yeah. were I would be dead I, like, I thought I had skin cancer like, like my mom would be like you don't have skin you know cancer. what I mean so anyways that all this to say that I went on YouTube and I searched up health anxiety like suffering or something like that and Dennis's channel came up and I could cry like it actually makes me want to get emotional thinking about how much his videos helped me like I would watch them and it would be part of my routine I would be like watch at least one the anxiety guy video a week and I'm not sure if he's gonna listen to this later on but he's gonna hear me like rave about this but it's true like I would watch it and it would make me feel better then I got my first job and the health anxiety kind of subsided but I still felt spurts of it every so often and I would put headphones in my ears while I was working at that first job and I would listen to his like 15 minute podcast and just what he was saying behind like what anxiety sufferers feel resonated so much and I just want to say this because if if there's anyone out there who suffers from health anxiety specifically any anxiety he's very helpful with and has many tools but that specifically go to his YouTube channel he has a very successful YouTube channel um and rightfully so because he's very like informative um yeah. And also living his best life out in Bali. So good for him. And we're super excited for you guys to hear this episode. We do we do um, like a little exercise that you guys can maybe use if you're anxiety sufferers. But yeah, I'm not going to do any weekly updates. I don't really have any relevant ones. And I feel like we want to just get straight into this episode so you guys don't like lose, you know, focus or whatever. So yeah, aka so, she was like, shut the fuck up. Yeah, without further ado, hope you guys enjoy. And yeah. So for those of you listening... Um, as you already know, today we have Dennis on the podcast. Dennis, how do we pronounce your last name? Because I don't want to butcher it. No problem. Simsek. 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 Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, AKA, uh, the anxiety guy, of course, um, you are a two-time author and you are a podcaster and a YouTuber, and I'm sure a lot more than that as well. So, um, I kind of want to let you get into it, kind of just tell our listeners a little bit about who you are. Um, what you do and and all of that and then we can get into the, the hot questions we have <laughs> yeah sure um yeah i've i've written a couple of books on uh different types of anxiety disorders and it's all based on my experiences and my studies you know i went through a decade of anxiety disorders actually in fact it started really really young um a lot of pressure a lot of stress um and at the end of it all, I said, you know, what can I do with this? Can I, uh, can I share a book with people or some info? And would anybody actually listen to me? Mm-hmm. So I put the book out. People started to uh, engage with me. And next thing I knew, I was sucked into this world of helping people with uh, anxiety and, uh, and enlightenment. So, <laughs> yeah, here I am. <laughs> um, I do want to just like touch on my personal experience with you i know you don't know know us but i've actually been following you for a while so if you're okay with it i'm going to just tell you a little story about how i discovered all of it but um and also for those of you listening i i was going through a lot of i still go through anxiety but especially when the whole pandemic happened um it was exacerbated of course and it was to the point where i didn't know like where to turn or what to do. I had never tried therapy before. And I came across your YouTube channel specifically because I was keywording health anxiety um, in the search bar. So a lot of your videos came up, um, your podcast came up and your Facebook community group came up. So I really resonated with a lot of the videos that you were talking about and it really helped me through that tough time. So thank you for that. But oh, that's um, great. I know some of your videos noted that you had experienced a lot of health anxiety in your past, like you just mentioned. And if you're comfortable, we'd love to know and for our listeners to know the story of kind of how that started, how you identified that it was health anxiety and what brought you to be able to be the mentor you are now to people like me and other people out there. Yeah, 100%. Um, You know, for me, it started really, really young. You know, the blueprint for my who I was and what life looked like started around four or five, probably even earlier, where I started to create these associations between things. You know, when I was, as we all are, when we're born, we're born into mother and father, and we don't know what God is. We don't know what right is. We don't know what wrong is, good, bad. So mom and dad are like the gods, right? And whatever they do is kind of, you know, creates the meaning for things and creates the association for things. So 
mom and dad were fighting a lot. There was a lot of stress, a lot of pressure in the, in the environment at home. And I associated love to that kind of thing. So mm-hmm. for me, love was suffering in many ways at an unconscious level. And then later on in my life, you know, only in the last 10 years, I started to change the meaning of love to what I thought was, you know, what the conscious meaning of love was. So it wasn't this addicted to suffering kind of thing where I was plugged into some form of anxiety for what seemed like my whole life. But I had to recreate all these new uh, definitions of things, starting with love. So Mm. uh, my anxiety started very, very young, as does uh, most people with the blueprint and the identity of who they are and what the world's like. And then um, I just found suffering in many different ways. One way was, you know, through the tests and the studies and I have to, I have to, and the perfectionism and the fear of responsibility and all these sorts of things. And then it transferred into health anxiety and health anxiety for me was all consuming. I woke up in the morning I touched my body. I, oh my God, what's that little mole on my leg? Oh my God. Like, is my head getting bigger? You know, like, oh, I've got a little twitch on my arm. Could it be something serious? And of course, if you go on search, search engines and Google, you know, you're going to find cancer. You're going to find tumor. You're going to find all these other things. And literally, yeah, I died a million times and yet I'm still here, you know, so, uh, the health anxiety kind of was spurred on because of me looking for information on the outside and then kind of triggering more anxiety within me. So that went on for years until I got to a point where I started to learn certain techniques that helped me to speak to the side of me that was really, really scared, afraid, angry, a lot of rage, um, Uh, But the conscious part of me was good. Like I conscious part of me could look at a mole and say, hey, that's just a bloody mole. Like it's just what it is. Right. Right. But the unconscious part of me, which ran the show, said, no, you better stay hyper focused on it. You better go to the doctor for it. You better check in with people on it. And so I had to find ways to communicate to that deeper part of me so that both of my minds were kind of communicating at the same level. So Mm -hmm. that was my journey. I, and I like really resonate with that because same thing with me. It's like, I'm almost, it's gotten better now, but it's almost like I'm afraid to shower because I don't want to go in the shower and like have to look at myself and be like, what's that? What's this? And it, when you say all consuming, I think that that word just like really defines the feeling of health anxiety. And I, and, and I feel like a lot of people go through health anxiety, but don't actually know that it is Mm -hmm. health anxiety. And one of the questions we got in, I was going to say this later, but since I'm saying I'm mentioning it now was like, how do you know when it's health anxiety and when you actually need to go to the doctor? Um, And that's what I kept telling myself. I was like, this isn't health anxiety. Like I, what if something's wrong? I need to go to the doctor, but then you keep telling yourself that over and over and over again, you know? So I I would would do both. So I would see something on my body, get anxiety. And I think I made like, I'm not even kidding four trips to the hospital within like a week. Remember? Yeah. yeah, I I would, my heart would, would, palpitate I'm having a heart attack I put my arm in the air to see if my arm's numb I have a lot of moles on my body and I'd see one shift or shape and I'd be like I have skin cancer I need to go to the hospital and the doctor at the hospital was like you've you've been at McKenzie Health Hospital four times in the last week like nothing is wrong with you but I think you convince yourself or your mind convinces yourself that there is something wrong and if I don't seek medical help, I'm going to die. And it came to a point where I was even like, I don't trust these doctors because they're telling me that I don't have anything wrong with me, but I know I do, but they're medical experts. Mm. They know, you know, so that's a fine right. line too. Cause it's like, yeah, okay. You go to the doctor, but even if the doctor says, no, you're fine. You're still thinking that there's something wrong with you. Right. Sure. So the ultimate question is, you know, with all of this, what is it that we are truly potentially at the deepest levels really looking for that we're receiving from health anxiety. Mm -hmm. Nobody really takes the time to go deep enough to that level. And a big part of that was for me was uh, being appreciated by others, Mm -hmm. being connected to others, um, being listened to by others. When I went to the doctors, when I went to the nurses, everybody surrounded me. Yeah. You know, I was like, Oh, Dennis, this Dennis, that. So I was like, damn, this is kind of cool, right? I never get this when I don't have anxiety. Right. So those are called secondary gains. The secondary gains was a big motivator to keep my health anxiety alive. 
Um, my fiance, oh man, she was hugging me. She was loving me. She was listening to me. <laughs> Everything's going to be fine. Patting me on the back. I'm not saying this is for everybody, but it mm-hmm. was for me. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Um, was there a question? No, no, <laughs> no, sorry. We just wanted to kind of yeah get your, your, your output on that. Yeah. Your experience goes hand in hand with what I went through for so many. I got to know the nurses by their first name. They're like, mm-hmm. oh, Dennis, here you are again. You know, it's kind of like funny after a while. And it, yeah. But, um, and it it's um, when I was going through my health anxiety specifically, we we're at the cottage and I'm again, it had to do with like a mole. And I was going, everyone was playing games outside. I remember. And I was in the dark room of like the cottage checking my skin and I get embarrassed because my mom was like, what are you doing? And I, I didn't want to say to her what I was doing because, you know, it's the same thing. We, we grew up in an Italian household, very kind of strict, like we don't strong. I mean, anxiety young. is not really mm. a thing, you mm. know, especially mm-hmm. when it comes to your body or health anxiety. So when I would say something, you know, my cousins, my, my family would be like, you're over exaggerating, stop being stupid. And it, that would put me more in a spiral. Cause it's like, well, no one's really listening to me. And yes. now I have to kind of suffer this kind of anxiety by myself. Yes. So yes. I think that's, um, that's a huge part of it. But I wonder that kind of goes into what you're saying, like, get to the root of your health anxiety and you talk about your inner child and we've heard that that word so many times but from a different perspective how you put it so we hear it as like um you have to follow the instincts of your inner child in in order to heal it but you have a different perspective on the inner child so can you talk a bit more about the inner child and and anxiety like kind of what that resonation would be yeah um when i look at inner child i think between conception and around the age of seven and if you think about like my interpretation of inner child conception to about the age of seven still lives within you so those belief systems those ideas about things those behaviors all of those things still live within you Mm -hmm. and then you know as our conscious mind starts to develop as we go on we start to come into conflict with with two different kinds of beliefs we got the beliefs that are updated the ones that we're aware of right now, the ideas, the thoughts that we go through today. But then there are those uh, instincts, emotional reactions. There are those core beliefs that come from the inner child that still live within you. And if, you know, studies have shown that, you know, uh, I believe it's 85 or 90 percent of what you do throughout the day is, is unconscious. And so all of that unconsciousness is coming from the inner child. So Mm -hmm. most of us go through the day in what I like to call a zombie consciousness, where we're really not aware of what we're doing. We're just going stimuli, reaction, stimuli, reaction, right? So when I think about inner child, I think about initial feelings. Um, I'm going to go on a roller coaster. Okay. What's my initial feeling? My initial feeling says, are you crazy to go on that? Like, what's the point of that? Mm -hmm. Right? You could die. So that's inner child. Um, you know, I'm about to go into a social event with a lot of people. What's the initial feeling, right? It's like, you're going to make a fool of yourself, Mm. right? People are going to see your sensations. You're going to see your blushing, you're sweating. Why would you want to do that? So these initial feelings can be connected to what I like to refer to as being the inner child. And the question becomes, you know, at what point in in your life do you start to realize that your initial feelings are starting to align with your conscious thoughts? So when you can create that kind of congruence, then life starts to have some flow. You know, you're no longer in this place called the addiction of suffering. You're no longer experiencing anxiety. You may experience anxiousness, which is Mm. totally different, right? I mean, we're all going to get anxious at some point, but when we start to create that congruence, we no longer allow it to to become a form of anxiety, whether it's health anxiety or generalized anxiety or panic disorder, whatever it is, right? So it's this ability to to understand how to communicate with the deeper side of you uh, and and upgrade those core beliefs to the point where you say, hey, that's not true anymore, right? Mm -hmm. Those initial feelings have nothing to do with this situation or the upcoming situation. Uh, This is what it really means, Mm -hmm. right? So that's really the goal. So it's what I've heard. We, we spoke to someone else came on the podcast a couple of months ago, and she was talking about um, healing mechanisms to anxiety and just um, mental health symptoms and issues in general. And it was, I think it's kind of the same thing as you're saying, where it's facts over feelings, correct? Like 
like we don't want to yeah kind of <laughs> we don't want to like sort of base our decisions or the way the way we're acting in the moment on our initial feelings of that sure. moment right sure yeah at least you want to question those but you know in talk therapy today, the, you know, there's a lot of facts that get spurred on, right? Yeah. Fact, you know, you're not, you're not going to die from the symptom, you know, you're not going to die from the social event, you're not going to make a fool of yourself. So we hear all those facts. And, and what tends to happen is we tend to revert to logic to heal our anxiety, mm, right? Yeah. And logic is the weakest way to heal anxiety. Okay, That's so if you're using logic or positive thinking, it's very difficult to, to convince the inner child subconscious mind that something is in fact different than the way it's seeing it. Mm. So um, I personally wouldn't rely on facts or else you'll be spending a lot of time kind of going in circles. Huh. Um, but rather there needs to be some uncomfortable, unfamiliar and strange sometimes ways of, of communicating with the inner child and purging the feelings that are stuck in the body. Cause there's a lot of buildup in the body. There's a lot of rage. There's a lot of fear that needs to be purged. Can you um, detail, detail some tangible, I guess, exercises or ways to get to that point or to get to, um, to start healing from or even anxiety? Cause or I even... know you reference healing and not coping, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Okay. No, um, I was going to say uh, to jump on that, or even just questions to ask yourself, to prompt yourself, like how to heal that. Sure. Yeah, we, I mean, there's usually one question and I like to start with one transitional exercise. Um, are you guys open to it? It'll take two minutes. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so I want you to think about an aspect of your life where if anything went wrong, you'd be able to handle it. You've got total trust in it. You've got total faith in it. And you're just so good at this aspect of your life, whether it's relationships or finances, that no matter what went wrong, you'd still be able to, you'd be fine. Mm, okay. Grab that. Okay. So close your eyes for a second. And as you close your eyes, I want you to see that picture on the left. Okay. I want you to notice that that picture is on the left. I want you to notice how in control you are, how empowered you are how much trust you have in that. Let me know when you have that picture. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. And then on the picture on the right is an anxious moment that you recently experienced. Notice where you are. Notice how you're reacting. Tell me when you have that picture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So I'm going to count from three all the way down to one. When I get to one, you're going to transfer the person on the left into the person on the right. And all you're going to do is observe how that person deals with that situation. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Three, two, one. And just observe. What's it like when this person is in that same situation? Notice some of the differences. And when you're ready, you can open up your eyes and share some feedback. I feel like my left per person, my left side of me um, was very, I, I don't know, you go first. No, you, you go first. <laughs> no, I'm nervous. <laughs> I'm nervous you're, you're talking first, you go first. Okay, so the side of me that is in control of the situation has a lot to do with my endeavors like in the podcast and just things that I'm passionate about like I know if something were to go wrong like if this zoom call were to pause or like technical issues or even like we're not getting to where we want to be in a certain amount of time I'm so determined to do it that I'm confident because we have done this up until now with no experience and, and it's working mm, so I'm like that was on the left yeah confident mm. and determined on the mm -hmm. right um the most recent ang like anxious moment I've had or anxiety I've had was actually this morning when I woke up, um, there was like a lot of pressure outside. It was raining this morning and I was anxious because I had some meetings today that were, that I didn't know how they were going to turn out. Mm -hmm. um, and it had a lot to do with like professional development, I guess mm -hmm. I could say without giving too much away, mm -hmm. but um, that makes me anxious because I don't have control and I care a lot about what other people think. 
when the decision is in their hands. And when that person on the left transfers over to the person on the right, it's just like, it's almost like I'm sitting up more and it's like, I'm more confident and it's just determination. I don't know how to describe it other than like, I'm just determined and I know I'll get what I want Mm -hmm. type of thing. But I don't know if that's Mm -hmm. a good thing because it almost feels like I always need to be in control in order to feel okay. okay. So you'll, you're going to notice more than anything, the first thing you, you said that there was a physiological change, right? Like the body looked different yeah. than how you were initially. So when I work with people, some of the responding ways don't have anything to do with thoughts or changing thoughts or anything like that. It has everything to do with changing aspects of the body because mm. it's easier to change the mind through the body than it is to change the body through the mind. Okay, at least in my experience, if if I'm going to change my posture, all of a sudden, you know, I start to perceive things differently, Mm -hmm. right? So if if I start to use hand gestures like you Italians love to do, (laughs) now I'm engaged in the present moment, right? Mm -hmm. So instead of being down here and thinking about what's going to happen in the future, right? So you notice that when you move the person from the left to the right, there was a physiological change. And that's just one way just a really quick way of going, holy smokes, like I really can be someone different in that moment. Yeah. It's, it's crazy to see, like when you really think about it. Hmm. There's a, there's a practice that, you know, it is very practical and can be used each and every day for different situations. Hmm. Right. And then secondly, the question that you would ask as you're going through the day, first of all, you'd create a new identity for yourself, not anxiety suffer, which is the unconscious label we put on ourselves many times, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Instead, I'm the rock, right? Sam is the rock, okay? Whatever that means to you. And so as I'm going through the day, you would ask yourself the, the question of how would the rock respond in this very situation? How would the rock see this upcoming future scenario? How would the rock enter the meeting? So instead of unconsciously allowing the anxiety sufferer to play the role of what's going to happen in the future. Instead, you pick the identity, you ask yourself the question of how would this person instead approach the situation? And then you'd kind of brainstorm from there. So that's, that's another very practical way of approaching things. That's really interesting. I've never thought about it that way. And also I've never done a a practice like Exercise that. Like so that. do you want to briefly yeah. say yours before we move? On? Sure. Um, Just for, for me. Um, so on the left side, I had a lot to do with um, what I'm confident in is right now I'm in like a process of an interview. And I know that like, if I don't get this interview, if I don't get this full-time job, I'm still going to be okay. I've been, you know, in school and I've been doing like me for a long time without a job. So I know that'll be okay. I know that something better is coming, whether it's with the podcast, whether it's with, you know, another opportunity. And on the right hand side, um, recently anxiety would just be like my relationships with people, whether that's relationships or friendships, I find that I overthink a lot. So when I'm in like a moment of despair, when it comes to my relationships, I shut down immediately. I meek myself and I'm just like, totally closed off it's like i literally can't speak or say how i feel so when the left person went to the right side it was almost like it's weird it was almost like on the right side it was raining and gloomy i'm like in my room in my bed with like covers and then as soon as the left person came in i didn't really it's weird to even say it's like it like sun came and it's almost like i'm standing like really tall like you said the posture i'm standing tall and strong and like i'm using my voice like my throat chakra is almost like (laughs) opening where it's like it's okay you don't have to make yourself you don't have to overthink like you have all the tools you need to overcome like the situation so kind of guess similar to what yours was but the the main thing was colors i was seeing on the right side Mm -hmm. dark Mm -hmm. depressing almost like i'm in like a haunted room where the left side was bright yellows like it's so i think that's where and it got you thinking Right. It did. That's kind me, of this. That made me happy to with, do that exercise. Without getting too personal, I do think I have um, some anxiety. You know, our parents are also separated, so I, I do think I have some anxiety towards relationships. relationships that whether that's friendships, whether that's my boyfriend, whether that's like my sister, I have some sort of block there where it's like if something goes wrong, instantly I shut down and I feel like I'm like like big guard and wall is up and I get defensive and I'm not going to go into it, but, yeah, it, was like making a therapy session. <laughs> but no, it's, that's where I was at. Anyways, 
Right, but anyways, right. thank you for that. That was that's yeah, super cool. I sure. hope the listeners. I encourage that. all the listeners to do that activity as well. That was that was interesting perspective. Um, yeah. just before we like wrap up this like really great call. Um, this also wasn't in the notes, so feel free not to answer this. Like we can always cut it out. But um, a lot of what we talk about on the podcast too is um career ish development professional development how people got to where they are and Mm -hmm. you are a youtuber and that's a pretty cool job i don't know if that's your job or if you consider it a hobby a passion Mm -hmm. but um can you talk on that like how you became like just a youtuber i know you started speaking about anxiety and healing from it and probably sharing it but how is it like being like a full-time youtuber now yeah um it's um it's been interesting in that uh, in the beginning, when I look back on my initial videos, I'm going, wow, like, what the heck was I thinking with those? <laughs> like, what, what am I talking about? What do I look like? Where am I? I'm like, you know, I'm uh, not paying any attention to it. But at the same time, people were able to relate to my story and the things I was saying. Um, to be, you know, for me, what really made the biggest difference with YouTube was um not doing too much, but having allow. So for example, I would do a video and once the video is done with anxiety, I would look back and say, did I do it right? Was everything okay? Could the lighting have been better? Right. And then I would do another video at night. And then in the morning I do another one and it just never was good enough. Mm -hmm. And so I'd never post it. And then, you know, the YouTube success came when I created a system kind of like once a week, one video, if it's shitty, Sorry, if it's crappy, no, it's okay. crappy. <laughs> uh, if it's good, it's good. You know, I don't make that decision. Others will, and I'll see it as feedback. So my biggest success with YouTube came when I started to do the work, upload the video, and just kind of leave it alone. Just mm-hmm. leave it alone. And when I left it alone, whether it was good or bad, I got the feedback that I needed to make the next, to apply it into the next video. This is one of the toughest things for people starting because they're always, especially with anxiety, they're always trying to make it perfect, make it ideal, think about the other people. And, and next thing you know, you never get started. You know, getting started is, is probably the most difficult thing and having the faith that you can do the work, put it up there and just kind of leave it alone, see the feedback, engage with people and kind of go in that route. So Mm -hmm. my biggest success with that YouTube was, was to really trust in the knowledge that I had and the environment I was in and just kind of put it out there and see what happens. Um, That wasn't just a professional growth. It was a massive personal growth for me as Mm -hmm. well. So uh, for anybody out there who's ready to do the YouTube thing or the podcast thing, I highly recommend not trying to make it perfect, not trying to be the perfectionist, but instead because it's the wild west online and nobody's really going to really care is. about what you posted today and in, in the next six months, why don't you just put it up, mm-hmm. you know, feel good about yourself, see it as some kind of personal development uh, step and, and, and really find ways to enjoy the journey as much as you can. Cause that's going to keep you going for the long term. I love that. That's yeah. good advice. And you know what, like, we just started this podcast like a year ish ago and like, we were never love people it. to thanks. <laughs> we were never yeah. people to, we, I never thought I would do something like this, honestly, like film myself and like, look at my, how I look at myself and then put it on Instagram and talk about my opinions without really caring what people think. Cause like you said, we're just posting it. We're not really talking to anyone, you know, like there's no audience. It could be so zero people listening. It, yeah. <laughs> so, but it's giving me a, yeah. a sense of, Oh, this says we're running in time. Okay. I'm quick. Um, it gives us like a sense of almost like self-confidence. Like I've grown so much more confident in my opinions and myself. Um, so I, I totally resonate with that. And yeah. obviously your YouTube is super successful. And again, very much resonated with me during a hard time. So I highly encourage Good. everyone to check it out. Yes, I agree. Thank you. Awesome. No problem. Um, yeah. Um, along those lines. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, again, it's, it's this ability to, to, to kind of disidentify from being anxiety. I know we're probably getting to the end here, but no. um, one, of, one of the biggest things for me, just kind of going back to the anxiety and the professional world was I always checked in with the anxiety identity. Like, oh, can the anxiety identity do the YouTube video? Can the anxiety identity build this mm-hmm. business? Can the anxiety identity, you know, engage with these influencers? But 
little did I realize that, you know, I had the opportunity to recreate myself and re-identify with somebody new. And so I started to ask myself, you know, how would this person approach YouTube? How would this person approach the business? How would this person engage with this person? So mm-hmm. at any given moment, you have the opportunity and the freedom and the permission to be whoever you want to be anytime. And, you know, others should not dictate who you are. Your past should never dictate who you are today. So it's very important that people understand that it's easy to recreate yourself once you get started. That makes sense. Well, it kind of, this is kind of full circle back to the thing that you're saying about how would the rock do the thing sure. that she's anxious about on the right yeah. side. So it's kind of that sort of thing. I feel like, <clears throat> um, 100%. So thank you so much again for coming on. We're running out of time on this 40 minute Zoom limit, but um, we appreciate it a lot. Is there anything coming up that you can plug? Are you in the works of another book? <laughs> yeah, another book coming up, fourth book. Coming nice. Up and oh, four. I can okay. tell you, yeah. And I can tell you that the editing process kind of sucks. No. I'll be honest with you. It's really, if you're going to write a book, you know, first copy is kind of vomit copy. So mm-hmm. if you want to write a book, just get it out there. And the majority work is going to be in the editing. But the fourth book should be out beginning of the year, hopefully. And, wow. Uh, well, and we'll that. see. Yeah. Uh, that's pretty much uh, the only project going on right now. Other than that, I'm sitting back and I'm on the beach. No, no. Well, enjoy that. Yeah, enjoy yourself. <laughs> <laughs> thank you but so you don't much. Get to do in Toronto. Yeah. yeah very true. welcome. And thank you guys. You're doing an amazing job. Just thank, so. you. thank you. It means so a nice. lot. Have a good rest of your night. Have a good one. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Awesome. Bye. Okay, guys. So that was our episode with Dennis. Um such a nice guy. Like very informative. Just the way that he speaks makes me feel calmer and makes me feel heard and he just he knows how to like really help someone that suffers from anxiety mainly because he went through it so i think that like that's a really important aspect of someone who can help someone else heal from it but if you guys have any like questions or just want to share your experience or feel the need to like share obviously me and sam are open to like whatever we kind of got i i kind of got really deep on my anxiety and like i've never really said that before said it out loud so it's an open space to share. If you guys want to share about your anxiety or just have questions or, I don't know, feel free to message us or DM us. If you like the episode, make sure to give a thumbs up, like it. I have to, like we haven't said that in a while, but yeah, honestly, review, like, give, give us, us some a review. Reviews, like bro. the last review was from like last year. Like give us some updated reviews, some feedback that you guys want to hear. But um, overall, we hope you guys enjoyed it, and yeah, we'll see you in the one next one. One more thing. Do you want? We have a special event coming up. It's no, not... don't say that yet, Sam. Why? No, I just want to tease it. it. No, don't. Don't cut that out. Okay, I just want to say that we have some cool shit coming this summer. Not even say what the shit is, but it's coming, and I'm excited for it because we're actually like going through with it, um, and we're excited to even share what it is and what it is. But, yeah, yeah stay tuned for that. Okay. All right, guys. Bye. bye.